Good evening, guys. Welcome back to the Malaysian Architecture Education Online Series, proudly presented by MASA. You guys are doing well, and thank you for joining us again for tonight. So for those who are new, MASA is Malaysia Architecture Student Alliance, and it's a non-profit student committee acting under, directly under PAM, which is the Pertubuhan Architect Malaysia, consisting of students representative from all architecture institute in Malaysia. So during this time of MCO, MASA and PAM have decided to launch this um, online lecture series for students to be more productive and gain more insights. Architect Ardianta is the head of PAM Education and Dr. Zach Zarul is the convener. My name is Guma Sylvester Makajil, a MASA representative from UCSI University, and I will be your MC for tonight. So I would like to welcome our guest speaker for tonight, Associate uh, Professor Architect Mio Muhammad Farid, he is a, a lecturer at, he's currently a lecturer at the Department of Architecture, Faculty of Design and Architecture at UPM. He has served as a head of Department of Architecture from October 2007 until January 2016. He graduated from Iowa State University with a Bachelor of Arts and Architecture in 1986 and University of Tennessee with a Bachelor of Architecture in 1988. After graduation, he had worked for one year in Tennessee and Florida in the United States. He started his career as an architect in Malaysia in the late 1989, working with architect MAA, Sanjian Bahar. So in December 2000, he joined Mir Shah Hariman Architect as a senior architect and later as a partner. And currently, he practices as a sole proprietor under the style of Mio Architect, uh, Mio Farid Architect. Throughout his 30 years of career, architect Muhammad Farid has been involved with a variety of projects ranging from bungalow, condominiums, co commercial buildings, into institutional projects, aircraft hangars to hospital complex. He's currently serving as a board member of Lembaga Architect Malaysia, and he is a member of the Council of Architectural Accreditation and Education Malaysia since 2012. He is a Certified Architectural Accreditation and Validation Panelist with CAA, CAAEM and has conducted architectural accreditation visits to several architectural schools in Malaysia. He has also conducted validation visits to overseas schools such as Australia and, and United Kingdom. Due to his expertise in uh, architectural education, he has appointed as external examiner for architectural programs at various architectural institutions in Malaysia. He is passionate in the field of affordable and social housing and community architecture. He was the consultant for an LRGS project on improving the low-cost high-rise development. Since 2014, he has been involved with the Teratak Semai project, a self-building um, housing project, a self-built housing project to build homes for the Orang Asli community at Tapa Perak. So he is also currently a part of a team looking into alternative high density housing at UPM. So sit back and relax everyone. So we will have a Q&A session at the end of the talk, but if you have any questions during the sharing, feel free to type them down in the chat box so we can add them to them at the end of the sharing. Okay, so without further delays, I would like to invite architect Mio. I'll pass it to you. Thank you, thank you, Guma. Uh, student, welcome to MASA lecture series. Uh, for this session, I will be uh, sharing two presentations. One, briefing on Lembaga Architect Malaysia, and also on the Council of Architectural Accreditation and Education Malaysia or in Malay maps, uh, which regulate the architecture education in Malaysia. And my second lecture will, will discuss on design with context. Okay. So I shall proceed. Okay, for Lembaga Architect Malaysia, it's established under the Act of Parliament, under Architects Act 1967, and it's under the purview of Minister of Works Malaysia. So under Minister of Works Malaysia, we have the uh, LAM, Board of Architects Malaysia. We have the Board of Engineers, and also 
Board of Good Quantity Surveyors Malaysia. So three of the professional in Malaysia is parked under the Minister of Works. And uh, the act is uh, to provide for registration of architects, professional and graduates, and also the sole prop, partnerships, body corporates, and also multidisciplinary. Uh, recently, we added interior design, and we also have sub-professional building draftsman, uh, which uh, falls under the Lembaga Architect Malaysia. So under the section 3.1 and 3.2, the board shall consist of the following members. Eh? to form the Board of Architect Malaysia and they must be as a Malaysian citizen and who are appointed by the minister. So normally the, the appointment will be for two years and uh, it has about 20 representatives and the president is always from the public sector and mostly from JKR. And then we have uh, reps from public and private sector uh, myself represent the public sector under the academician. I have been, I've been serving the board for three terms now, six years already. And also we have one from Board of Engineers Malaysia, one from Board of Quantity Surveyor and Registered Building Draftsman and Interior Designer. And soon eventually we'll also add in Inspector of Works and also architectural technologies. So these two will be the new uh, uh, profession that will be added uh, to the, the Board of Architects of Malaysia. And we have one registrar. So currently our president is architect Zairul Abidin from JKR. And we have a former PEM president, uh, Dato' Izumi. And the current president is architect Lilian Tay. Okay. So the term for, for the current term is from October 2019 to September 21st. And then under the Board of Architect Malaysia, there are so many uh, committees and two council. One is the Architecture Examination Council of Malaysia. This council uh, look into the LAM Part 1 and Part 2 examination. So students coming from unrecognized school, will have to bring their portfolio and present to the council. And if they pass, they will get the recognition. And also the council of exam also conduct LAM part three to admit uh, a professional into the Board of Architect Malaysia. And also they will conduct interior design exam, but due to the MCO, so the, the exam has to be postponed uh, to the time. Under the Council of Architecture, Education, and Education Malaysia, or MAPS, um, the, the bulk of the work is to accredit architecture school in Malaysia and also to validate uh, architecture program overseas, mainly Australia and uh, United Kingdom. So in terms of uh, individual memberships for LAM Part 3 or our professional architects, currently as May 2020, we have about 2,200 architects and graduate architects uh, still about 2000 there are still uh, there are uh, student with uh, with master of architecture or part 2 qualification that do not register that's why the numbers very low actually should be more huh? and interior designers quite recently about 500 and so forth and inspector of works and architectural technologies is the new huh, category so for previously cloud of works, now we call them inspector of works, and to work for government project, they have to register with the board as inspector of works. Otherwise, they will not be allowed to supervise work at site. And also architectural technologies for those with LAM part one or bachelor of science in architecture or equivalent can now register as architectural technologies with Lembaga Architect Malaysia also. And in terms of practices, uh, sole prop uh, is the majority, about 1,200 uh, practices. And then partnership, 81, and body corporate is about 280. And for multidisciplinary, where we have the architect, the engineer, and QS, currently uh, about 50. Uh, in terms of world index uh, for the architects, uh, this one based uh, data based on uh, in 2013, with 7 billion population uh, 
the number of architects are about 1.3 million, giving us one architect serving 5,300 uh, population. Whereas in Malaysia, as of 2019, we have about 32.5 million population, but our numbers of architects is only about 2,200, giving us a, a ratio of one architect serving 14,000. So if we take uh, this uh, world uh, average, one architect serving 5,300, so we still, for a 32.5 million population, Malaysia needs about 6,000 architects. So currently it's about 2,200. So meaning we still need more architects eh, to serve our population. So hopefully by the time you guys graduate, there will still be jobs eh, waiting for you guys. Okay? Then under the board also, <coughs> This one is the function uh, to regulate the code of conduct and ethics of architects, graduate architects, interior designer, building draftman, inspector of works, and architectural technologies. And the function of the board also, as I mentioned before, the exam council uh, for part one and part two exam for students without uh, coming from undergraduate school, they have to sit in the part one and part two exam. And of course, the part three professional exam uh, to register as professional architect with Lembaga Architect Malaysia. And then under uh, section 41GB, to appoint a council consisting of such members uh, to advise and regulate matters relating to architectural and interior design education, including the certificate, certification and recognition of such programs. So <clears throat> this is basically the function of MAPS. So in actuality, MAP is just like uh, the guardian of the architectural education in Malaysia. So the composition of maps uh, uh, for 2018 to 2020, we have uh, uh, from um, PAM also, we have uh, from academician mainly uh, from myself, I'm from UPM, uh, Prof. Syed Iskandar from UTM, Prof. Ramli is from private uh, city university, Dr. Rostam uh, from UITM, from UM and USM. So all, almost, uh, majority of the public and uh, private institute uh, composed of our maps. Uh, and also we have a uh, professional like architect Jasmine and Dr. Izumi uh, in, and even architect Nozaini as one of the member. And we have also from interior design, Ms. Nur Diana and also Sabah and Sarawak uh, representative. And we have also different representative from Minister of Higher Education and also from nation qualifying uh, agency. So of course, the main function of MAPS is to, to conduct uh, aggregation of architecture programs in Malaysia. And as of December 2019, uh, 18 architecture school in Malaysia have received their aggregation, while five more have been granted permission to run architecture program. So once they have a graduating cohort, they will invite uh, LAM to, to conduct accreditation visit. Whereas uh, for uh, validation as of uh, 2019 or so, we have about 20 architecture school that have been validated by MAPS, uh, four school from Australia and uh, 20 from United Kingdom. So these are the school. Uh, for LAM part one, we have about 18 institutions from public and private institution. And for LAM part two or MH program, uh, 10 institutions have received their recognition. Whereas uh, the non accredited school running the LAM part one program, we have five uh, UTHM, Batu Pahat, UMK in Kelantan, Segi University. UITM Sarawak and also Unimas Kuching. So uh, the numbers keep growing. Even the LAM part two of MH program, there are I think a few schools running, but they still haven't got their graduating cohort eh, called MAPS for the uh, accreditation visit. Whereas for validation school, 
we follow this manual, the LAMP policy and procedures for the validation of overseas architecture program. So currently we have four schools in Australia uh, receiving, uh, receiving our valida validation and 20 more from UK. And the last one was uh, Northumbria University, Newcastle. I think I've visited about four to five schools in UK and one school in Australia for the validation visit. Okay, so for our architecture education in Malaysia, we follow the UIA standard that uh, require five years of uh, architectural education from A level or equivalent. So for part one, it's minimum three years after STTM matriculation so, or A level and a minimum four years after SPM or O level. Currently only one school in Malaysia that uh, <coughs> admits student from SPM, it's uh, UITM in uh, Sri Iskandar and also in Puncha Alam. The rest all after A level eh? and the minimum credit hours is 120 and after you finish LAMP part one, uh, you have to work for minimum six months before you can enter into MH program or the LAMP part two. So the, the, the number of years is two years or 60 credit hours. And after you finish your LAMP part two, then after working two years, you can sit for the LAMP part three exam. And if you pass, then you can register as professional architect with the board. So all in all, about what, five to uh, seven years studying and working minimum to get your part three uh, recognition. So currently with the MCO, <coughs> the maps, maps also have given waiver, uh, the six month working experience. So for those with good result with their part one or Bachelor of Science, they can uh, proceed to part two or MH program without the six month working experience because we know currently the situation is bad. Eh? Uh, architecture firm is letting off their, their staff eh, go so they won't un unlikely to appoint new staff. So that's why we give waiver, eh? a bit of flexibility for students with good grades to enter direct into the MH or part two program. But after they finish their part two program, they have to cover back that six months. Meaning after they graduate, <coughs> they have to work six months. And after that, they can register as architecture graduate to top up that, uh, that, that six months uh, missing experience. Okay, and then uh, currently, <coughs> I mean, on I think 31st May, the Ministry of Higher Education issued this notice that there won't be uh, any face-to-face -face teaching and learning, and all has to be conducted online from uh, now till 31st December, except for five categories of students that will be allowed uh, to enter their campus uh, to, for face-to-face -face, uh, teaching and learning. So that five, five categories are the postgraduate student, uh, the master student, and the PhD student that uh, are, uh, conduct their research. But we also uh, requested that our MR student, even though it is by coursework, they should be allowed eh, to to uh, to be present at their campus to to use the facilities, the design studio to complete their studies in Master of Architecture. And of course, our final year student in, in part one, uh, it's quite critical for them to have face-to-face -face, uh, uh, teaching and learning to ensure that when they graduate from uh, the program, uh, it will meet the minimum uh, graduate attribute sets by, by MAPS and also by, by their particular school. So the, this one hopefully by uh, 1st July, uh, they will be allowed to, to enter campus. <clears throat> yeah. 
And of course, in the other category was student from TVET and also for the new intake eh, for part one or part two, uh, they will eventually enter uh, the, the architecture school earliest is 1st October 2020. So <clears throat> at the same time that uh, Ministry of Higher Education issued their media statement, MAPS also quickly come up with guideline in our special note number four. So during the MCO, we've issued a note one to three to cover the aspect of uh, online teaching and learning assessment and also design studios uh, that need to be conducted uh, online. So this serves to complement the media statement issued by uh, Ministry of Higher Education. So we still uh, uh, insist that for our graduating student, either part one or part two, to have face-to-face uh, -face, uh, uh, teaching and learning, face-to-face -face grade and final presentation uh, at their campus before we can release them uh, to, to the profession. Okay. So uh, this one is not uh, uploaded yet into, uh, onto the uh, Lembaga website, but hopefully by next week also, we'll upload the, the, the special note. So we are in the midst of translating this uh, note into English, so it can be shared by our uh, validated school in Australia and also in UK. Okay, so now with the new norm, we have to shift uh, our pedagogy, we have to, to shift our approach uh, for the, the old norm. We have our crit session uh, with the invited panels. Uh, and now with the new norm, everything is conducted online through WhatsApp, Telegram, uh, uh, Facebook, uh, and Zoom, of course. Uh, and we, we have to be you know, very conscious of the social distancing and uh, and to be uh, to 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 safeguard our safety also. So in conducting online learning, uh, a lot of challenges. So research have uh, that have been done uh, came to the opinion to the opinion that uh, online classes work best for highly organized and self-directed students, and self-motivation is really critical. Because uh, I'm teaching year two studio uh, for part one program, and it's quite tough for certain students. So I have to um, provoke them, cajole them, uh, to 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 motivate them uh, to to proceed under this trying time. And also because we are humans, uh, we are social creatures, we need that studio uh, uh, <coughs> environment uh, for for peer learning, for cross learning. Uh, and also uh, to be among our friends uh, to uh, proceed with our studio or design uh, in the studio. And currently also our campus uh, resources also lacking in, in this online materials also. This one conducted uh, in uh, US, uh, University of California, Irvine. And uh, in Malaysia conducted uh, this survey by USM also that there's of course a need for better design learning modules. Currently it's static, uh, it's not interactive enough. Uh, and our infra also is still lagging. We still need to upgrade our bandwidth. Uh, and also uh, the, the mindset uh, for both educators and students. We just can't go back to our old norm that somehow we have to adapt and accept uh, the new norm. And of course, the rising concern is on the digital divide. About 10% of students or even lecturers do not have an internet, internet connection at home. And another setback is the lack of a comprehensive digital blueprint on online teaching and learning. So what's next? So uh, to me, by, by next semester at least, uh, we have to look into blended learning uh, that we combine nine design modules to be conducted uh, online, at least for the half of first half of semester. And then design studio uh, has to be conducted face to face uh, with strict uh, SOP. So if you look at the traditional mode, we have the nine design modules and the design modules running concurrently for the 14 weeks of our academic uh, semester. 
but uh, after post covid 19 uh, i presume or uh, i would say that uh, the non design module to be conducted online for the first seven weeks and the final exam after that whereas the design module will happen uh, very intense uh, after our semester break, so it will be about seven weeks of design, or seven to nine uh, weeks of design module. So if under, under the normal mode, it's about what two days of studio, but for this post-COVID, probably eh, you have your studio almost every day to make up for the SLT or students learning time. And of course, our design review also have to be conducted online for, for this semester at least. Yeah? So you have to, uh, to be aware that currently uh, uh, the, the sandwich model is, is mostly adopted by current school where students have to submit their works dig digitally two days or three days ahead of the grid session for the panel to review. And then during the quick day, uh, it's just a Q&A session. Eh? So at least you cut short the time of, of, of Zoom uh, online or other platform. Eh? Then after that, of course, the moderation of the marks. Eh? And then I, I presume also our syllabus or curriculum need to be reviewed, need to be relooked. So topic like urban health or emergency architecture will come to the fore and even uh, emergence of joint degree like architecture and urban design uh, or, or architecture and landscape uh, will come uh, into play. Uh. Even uh, we have to relook again at uh, our definition of personal space, intimate space and public space to consider of the social distancing and new for data also. Uh eventually have to be relooked also so it's you can't just use that eh, that data anymore eh, with the current situation and of course our city and urban planning also eh, on the public spaces eh, have to really eh, have a serious eh, uh, overhaul okay so i think thank you very much eh. So I hope uh, you have learned something about Lembaga Architect Malaysia and also of the role of MAPS in regulating architecture education in Malaysia. With that, thank you and I shall proceed with the second lecture. Uh, there's one question <coughs> yeah. from uh, Mr. Ridzwan. Uh, yeah. How far LEM function and activity helping students at the diploma level? Okay. <coughs> Uh, currently, under the Act, we only uh, monitor or regulate architecture education at the degree level only. Eh? So we cover the Bachelor of Science in Architecture, equivalent to LEM Part 1, and also Master of Architecture, equivalent to LEM Part 2. So we, we do not regulate eh, or, or oversee the diploma or certificate education level. But if there is a need, eh, in the future, we might uh, them in uh, to be regulated under the board. But to do that, we have to amend our act first before or we are giving a mandate by the minister to also oversee our diploma and certificate education. So at least it will be a very holistic uh, uh, coverage of our architecture education in Malaysia. Yeah. All right. All I right. think that's all. Uh, that's all for the question for now. You may right. uh, proceed. Yeah. Okay, I shall proceed to our second lecture. Okay, my my second lecture is based uh, titled "Design with Context." I, I still feel there's a need. Huh? for student uh, to, to use context as your concept generator uh, to shape your, your design. Uh. I feel strongly about uh, this uh, design with context that you should take into account uh, the, the site uh, context, uh, the microclimate, the local materials uh, to generate your design intention and eventually uh, 
your design should be uh, uh, in harmony with your existing uh, surrounding or existing context. Okay. So just to refresh again, uh, what is concept? So concept uh, can be defined as an idea, a thought or notion that forms uh, the backbone and foundation of a design project and one that drives forward. Uh. So to have a strong concept, it will be easier for you to develop uh, your, your ideas uh, holistically. Uh. So it becomes the force and identity behind a project's uh, progress and is constantly consulted throughout every stage of its development. Meaning once you have your concept, that it should be applied. Uh from your site planning, <coughs> from your space planning, uh, your form making, and also even up to your detailing later on. So in other words, architectural concept can be described as an idea, notion, opinion, abstraction, philosophy, belief, inspiration, thought, intention, theory, image plan, or hypothesis. So architectural concept should primarily be generated from three key areas, the site, from the climate, microclimate, orientation, views, uh, access, context, history, and usage. Uh, this one uh, from our site analysis, we can uh, come up with uh, the, the architectural concept uh, derived from our analysis and synthesis uh, of the site analysis. And then, of course, the design brief also, the, the client's uh, requirement, uh, the client's needs, the client budget uh, need to be part of our concept. And the building typology also, that's the reason why we conduct precedent studies that we learn uh, from the past and we enhance it, uh, not to copy, but to emulate and improve on uh, the previous design by, by our predecessors. Uh. So design concept uh, will and should influence uh, the whole project, which should include the following, the exterior and interior, uh, the orientation, the massing, form, uh, openings, height, light, and so forth. And even the landscaping also. Try to have the same concept of your building design to the, the landscaping. So at least it's interrelated, even the finishes, the fixtures, structure, material, and so forth. So this is uh, one of my earlier projects when I was at Architect MEA uh, in 1993. We tried to enter, we, we entered into a design competition for a national theater design competition. Uh, so being a theater, we want to create this dynamic and, and a theatrical image and also to conjure uh, illusion of floating. That's why the forms very dynamic, uh, transform uh, from our vernacular Malay house. And of course, this illusion of floating to give the magical feeling of a theater. And basically, uh, what we have is we adopt the traditional uh, high gallery uh, seating and also the, the curtain tower. So to have these two pointed uh, <coughs> forms. And uh, my, my belief is that the plan, the form of the plan or the shape should also be uh, translated uh, onto the section. So at least uh, you can see the connection. Uh, in plan and in section because plan eh, is, is how you, you appreciate the space horizontally whereas section eh, reflect eh, your space uh, appreciation vertically so always work plan and section together eh. sometimes students leave it at the end to develop their section which is wrong it should be together with your space planning and of, co of course your vertical space planning eh, to work together so at least you can come up with a, a very good space. Eh? Because currently uh, student, even architect, concentrate on the white, on the black, eh, the, the forms. But the white, eh, the spaces that what eh, people will experience. That's why you should pay more attention to that white eh, instead of on the form, which is the black line, the black solid. Eh? 
So if you want the dramatic form, that dramatic feeling eh, or magical feeling should be reflected in the floor plan and of course in the section also. So uh, this one uh, in Berlin, eh, 1996. So previously, uh, where uh, Germany was divided into East and West, so Berlin, the city of Berlin, where they have this uh, Berlin Wall to separate East and West. Eh? But uh, November 1989, the wall tumbling down. Eh? So when I visited uh, Berlin in 1996, uh, the remnants of the wall still there. So I managed to to have a look and through the the the, the opening, I saw this uh, building. So it's piqued my interest to to come closer. So in 1996, about uh, end of October or, or early November, my wife got a scholarship to train in Sweden. So. Of course, I took uh, unpaid leave for four weeks to join her uh, with her training, and I just uh, roam around in, in Berlin, Vienna, uh, and of, of course, I took her also to London, Paris, and then also to Rome, Italy. So, when I came close, so it's actually probably a, a residential or office building, but somehow that over, over, uh, size uh, column probably not to serve a uh, structural uh, but merely to make a statement uh, about the, the boldness of, of the structure and this is one of the <coughs> uh, train station or the, the, the metro station in, in Berlin also and of course your design should make a statement also uh. For example, this one in Malmo, Sweden, where I stayed for about four weeks in uh, 1996, from October to November. So this knotted gun was designed uh, by a sculptor. It is also known as non-violence. Uh, after the death of John Lennon, uh, who was murdered uh, on 8 December 1980. Of course, John Lennon is part of the Beatles and uh, his friend, uh, Carl Frederick, uh, uh, come up with this uh, sculpture to re represent non-violent and has become a symbol uh, for peace and non-violent. So this one constructed in Malmo, Sweden. They have about, I think, nine or ten uh, replicated uh, in land in US, I think, and also in other part of Sweden also. So when I visited uh, uh, Malmo in 1996, uh, it was right near the train uh, station. But when I go, when I went back in 2017 with my MI students, somehow they have relocated the sculpture and about 500 meters away. So that's why uh, the posing is the same, but somehow the background is totally different. Eh? Of course, when you design also a splash of colors will be uh, good eh, to enhance the surrounding, to enhance your building also. Uh, this is just a parking structure, but eh, with colors, eh, the way the architect used these vertical fins with various colors, various shape. So as you walk along eh, the, the parking structure, you will see this uh, rhythm uh, of colorful uh, screens uh, dancing along the way. Uh. So if you could create that, uh, it would be just uh, nice uh, for your building and also for the surrounding, especially uh, during winter time uh, in, in Sweden. So this is one of my favorite buildings during my trip to the Scandinavian. This one in Bergen, Norway. So this colorful Bergen was listed uh, as a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1979. Uh. So it's just like a fisherman's wharf. Uh. So they just put a splash of colors. Uh, so against the backdrop of the white snow, somehow it's really uh, uh, wonderful. It's lifted your spirit during the, the cold uh, winter season. So to get to this Bergen, I have to venture about 
probably about 1,000 kilometers or so. So I started off in Malmo, the southern of the southern tip of uh, Sweden. So by night train, I uh, made a stop in Oslo uh, and then catch another train. Uh, and somewhere along this line, uh, I have to, we have to you know, <clears throat> change to bus ride. That is about, I think, two o'clock in the morning. So we have to take this bus journey to mountainous road, uh, this winding road. And from uh, there are about a couple of uh, passengers in the bus, as we go venture deeper into the mountains, more people uh, you know, embark on the bus. It is so surreal. Huh? And suddenly, uh, while sleepy and groggy, uh, I saw this notice or, or signboard saying, welcome, and, uh, welcome to hell. So I just but what? <laughs> is this real or not? Huh? Just so uh, like a twilight zone moment when you see this uh, welcome to hell signage. In fact, there is. Uh, a town named Hell, uh, but probably uh, in in uh, Norway it's uh, it's a different meaning from the the English term of Hell. Uh. So the the signage Hell uh, uh, is almost uh, a, a, a souvenir item that people were just steal uh, the signboard uh, every time and they got a chance. Uh. So. I have to go through hell to get to, to Bergen. That's what I'm trying to say. So while well, it's, uh, it's worth the travel, that uh, I have, uh, well, took a tram up to the top of this hill and have a fantastic view of, of Bergen. But it was very cold. Huh? I didn't have my winter boots, only my sneaker, my Nike, and I was freezing, but worth uh, the trip, uh, worth the call. So, yeah, to get to so-called paradise, uh, you have to got to go through hell. Uh. So just by adding that splash of colors uh, will uh, literally lift your building and literally lift uh, the spirit of where you travel. That's what happened to me. I just arrived uh, after train, after bus ride. Uh, was sleepy, tired, and but looking at this uh, picturesque image, suddenly uh, I got new life in me and helped me to, to continue with my uh, exploration of Bergen. Uh. But at the same time, uh, don't forget about the purity of white. Uh. Somehow white uh, can enhance uh, the, the, the surrounding, that's what uh, Richard Meyer did for his uh, Douglas House in Michigan. So the dramatic dialogue between that whiteness uh, of the house and the blues and the greens of the trees and, and the waters uh, and the sky allows the house not only to assert its own presence, but of course uh, it enhances uh, by contrast the beauty of the landscape. So your design, your building should uh, be part of your surrounding, but at the same time, it can be dominating, but at the same time, it also, by contrast, can also enhance uh, your surrounding also. That's what you should aspire as, uh, as a designer, as an architect, uh, eventually. So, uh, you should also design with words, but I mean, is to use our architecture jargons, uh, the, the juxtaposition, the design principles of balance, rhythm, unity, and so forth. Eh? Because a picture worth a thousand words, but words eh, can evoke a thousand emotions. So when you put words on your presentation board, think very carefully eh, what it means and, and what its purpose. Don't simply put eh, a superfluous or superficial words that you yourself eh, uh, hardly know what the, the, the rightful meaning of, 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 of the, the words that are put in on your boards. Okay, now to the real uh, topic <laughs> after a long and winding uh, uh, talk. Uh, this is my main intention uh, to, to create design uh, with context. So 
context of a building or site might include uh, among other things among other things the topography of the area whether it's flat or sloping so flat uh, is a different kind of a form and whereas sloping uh, require a different kind of shape and then of course the site history and previous usage the local culture architectural style local materials available and, and the construction techniques weather and microclimate also play an important role in shaping your design and political condition national and local policy of course the authority requirement also comes into play and the state of the economy i won't touch every aspect only a few of the the the, the context so just to go back in time uh, Vietnam War from 1955 to 1975. Uh, previously, Vietnam also was divided into the North Vietnam under the control of the Communist Chinese Party and also the South Vietnam. It's uh, under the protection of the Americans. So after long years of civil war, the Americans decided to coming into the war and they uh, brought their uh, soldiers uh, into the battlefield. So this uh, terrible, tragic war even immortalized in movies like Forrest Gump, uh, Apocalypse Now, uh, start Marlon Brando and the Plateau and of course Robin Williams uh, and the Good Morning Vietnam uh, movie. So uh, to commemorate uh, the, the sacrifice of the fallen soldiers, so the United States government decided to launch a design competition to come up with the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. So after, uh, by March 30th, uh, 1981, about 1,421 design was submitted. And, uh, uh, the location uh, is uh, located near the Lincoln Memorial and also uh, facing the Washington Monument. So, of course, um, the, the many submissions received by the committee uh, have this typical uh, memorial uh, with built structures uh, glor glorifying uh, the, the statues and whatnot. Uh, so this is the typical uh, memorial that we have. Eh? For example, this Marine Corps, uh, Iwo Jima, uh, with the soldiers uh, planting the, the flag. And of course, in Malaysia, we have this Tugu Negara in KL at the Lake Garden. Eh? And uh, the, the site is located also within two eh, prominent monuments or memorial. Uh, one is the the Washington Monument, uh, this obelisk shape, uh, the, the Washington Memorial, uh, obviously a, a nice uh, promenade or, or plaza with reflecting pool, and fronting it is the Lincoln uh, Memorial, of course, to honor the uh, Abraham Lincoln, one of the US president. But the winning, uh, entrance was from a student at that time, Maya Lin, an architecture student studying at Yale University. If I'm not mistaken, she was at that time a second year student and her professor encouraged her to enter this competition and it was a blind review, meaning no names appeared on the board except your uh, the your numbers, 1026, so no names. So Probably that helped also for the jurors not to be biased with, with who you are and they just pick the best design that really uh, uh, different and also catch the spirit what the Vietnam Veteran uh, Memorial should be. But her, her plan was minimal, uh, no built structures, uh, no statues, uh, only uh, a cut uh, that represent uh, the wound that never healed. So her minimal plan was in sharp contrast uh, to the traditional 
format for a memorial which usually included a figurative heroic sculpture. Of course, at that time, a lot of controversies, a lot of objection from the traditionalists, but um, somehow they agreed to proceed with the design and she has to work with a registered architect to make her design uh, into reality. So that's what her, her, and, uh, her design, uh, to have a V-shape that link up or have the actual uh, axial and visual connection to the Lincoln Memorial, and one uh, actual connection to the Washington Monument. Uh. So the V-shaped uh, memorial wall represent uh, the wall that the wound that never healed. Uh. So more than fifty-eight names of the fallen uh, soldiers were inscribed on the black black night uh, along this V-shaped wall, sunken wall. I mean, so that's her design. Very naive um, idea, but very powerful. That somehow translated into this memorial uh, of the, 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 the black granite uh, inscribing the names of the fallen soldiers. And that's uh, her intention, uh, have a very strong actual connection with Lincoln Memorial and of course the Washington Monument, uh, the visual and actual uh, linkages uh, from her wall to that monument also. And that's the White House, so the White House also uh, somehow uh, interconnected also. Uh, if not visually, it's also implied uh, a connection. So while working with your design, also look at the uh, macro level also. Don't just zoom in on your side, but you have to look at the big picture and try to make connection with existing structure. So at least you have uh, some justification to have a certain axis that uh, relate to your design and also to, to existing build structure. So that's what uh, her, her vision was, uh, to have this, uh, this black granite with the names uh, and as the, the visitor walk to and see the name, they also have the visual connection with the Washington Monument. <coughs> It's quite a very humbling and uh, emotional experience. Uh, I did manage to visit, uh, even though I have I don't have any names uh, that that's familiar or related to me. But I can feel uh, the emotion, the, the sadness, uh, uh, going through the names. Just you, the names, the greens, and the blue sky. So just a humbling uh, uh, experience. Uh. But during this current pandemic situation, uh, in just a few months, the, the coronavirus has killed uh, more Americans than 20 years of war in Vietnam. In Vietnam, they lost about 58,000 uh, sold, 58, soldiers uh, in 20 years, but the COVID-19 uh, cost about, well, I think, more than 100,000 uh, American lives uh, currently. So for her effort uh, in uh, 2016, uh, Barack Obama, the, the then president of USA, uh, accorded her uh, the Presidential Medal of Freedom uh, to Maya Lin. So this uh, Medal of Freedom is the highest honor that you can confer to civilian. So uh, uh, same time with her, uh, Barack Obama also uh, recognized Michael Jordan, the greatest basketball player of all time, and the Bruce Springsteen, uh, the, the rockers, uh, named the boss uh, in the United States. So, uh, 2016 and uh, Maya Lin in 1981 with her winning design. Uh, so Maya Lin was honored for boldly challenging our understanding of the world through designs that bring people of all walks of life together in spirits of remembrance, introspection, and humility. So that's what a design or build structure should be. 
to evoke a certain emotion or, or feeling. That what you as a de designer should aspire uh, your design to be not just about form making, but also to conjure this, this special feeling, special experience. Okay, now from uh, a side with context, what about if you are designing with uh, no immediate context? For example, on a hilltop. Uh, and uh, a very nice, uh, peaceful surrounding. So this is what uh, Le Corbusier did for his chapel Notre Dame in 1950. So Le Corbusier uh, took into account the curtains of trees uh, to, to, to come up with his design of the chapel. So remember what I said about uh, the plans and your section somehow should be related. So that's what uh, Le Corbusier also did. His plans have a bit of curve, so that was reflected uh, in the form of the chapel. And it's become like a figure ground also, uh, as, as mentioned by uh, Francis B. K. Ching, that uh, our perception of shape uh, depends on the degree of visual contrast that exists along the contour, separating a figure from its crown or between a form and its field. Uh, so that's why when uh, with my studio, I always stress on this figure ground study. I know during your first year, you did a lot of figure ground studies and the void and the solid, uh, but somehow as you go up, you somehow uh, totally forgot about this uh, figure ground studies. Uh, so this sketch also reflect uh, what uh, Le Corbusier did. This is sketched by Renzo Piano because he was tasked to, to do uh, an addition to this chapel. Uh, so he quickly come up with the, the sketch. So this is the original sketch uh, drawings by Le Corbusier. You notice uh, the, the modular uh, figure and he tried to, to, to have natural light and that come in into the chapel to, to give a spiritual uh, feeling towards it. Uh. And of course the, the raw material, the structure also blends in well uh, with the, the natural light that somehow filter in into the interior. So to him, uh, architecture is uh, the learned game, correct and magnificent of forms assembled in the light. So you need light also to accentuate, uh, to enhance the, the, the spaces and also to bring life to your static uh, forms also. So even the form also, to me, it resembles uh, uh, hands cups together in, in, in seeking for divine uh, intervention. Such a majestic um, building uh, on top of a hill uh, surrounded by curtains of tree. Okay, another uh, building design that somehow uh, blends well with the natural landscaping. This one in uh, Denmark also, north, northern of, uh, north of Copenhagen. I did manage to bring my student in 2017 to visit this uh, museum, Louisiana Museum of Modern Art. So just very peaceful that somehow the building uh, uh, blended harmoniously with the, the beautiful landscape also. So that's what the intention of the architect. They started in 1958, but uh, the various additions uh, were added uh, throughout the years until uh, today. So the red colors was the first building, uh, building constructed in, I think, about 1966, um, actually uh, it started off as a villa and then it eventually grows into a museum. <clears throat> so that's the, the, the existing villa. And the architect tried uh, to, to capture this fantastic view of the 
the lake. Uh, so they envision that uh, while viewing the artwork also, the visitors can also enjoy uh, the, the glorious uh, view of the natural surrounding. And also they uh, uh, utilize a lot of natural daylighting, but not direct sunlight, just diffuse sunlight that have a clear story or window that's uh you know diffuse that lit up the internal space so at least it won't harm uh, the, the artifacts or the paintings that being displayed eh? so that's the view uh, the fantastic gorgeous view of the site so i did manage to, to enjoy that beautiful scenery in 2017 and that sweater I bought in 1996 and still uh, fit um, my my size uh, when I went back in 2017. So in your design also look for the opportunity to frame uh, your views. Uh, so try to come up uh, with that views within your space that uh, visitors or the, the people using your space can uh, also enjoy the beautiful uh, scenery outside of your building so they are designed to into account and uh, the outside inside there's no clear boundaries uh, and also the artworks and the view outside uh, just complementary uh, to each other so that's dr once Rihani, my partner in crime when we uh, visited the place uh, with our MArch students in 2017, 22nd hmm? March, huh? 2017. So even the outdoor spaces uh, or the lawn uh, are littered with uh, uh, sculptures and installation also. Hmm? So you can hardly see the building. It's all low rise, very humble. Huh? To the ground that somehow merge with the beautiful landscaping and i think the few of the sculptures and one very prominent uh, sculpture by henry moore also that uh, uh, spread out uh, through the garden so again uh, when you are designing uh, galleries or museum uh, Pay attention to the, the light that come in. You can have a very direct sunlight. It will cause glare and also damage the, the artifacts that being display. So you should uh, reflect or refract the, the light to give a more diffuse, soft, natural lighting. And have that view outside. So it gives like orientation uh, to the visitor and also give visual relief also uh, when you are building somehow uh, a glimpse of green can uh, uh, lift your spirit also so this is another one also uh, a design competition which we did want uh, and proceed with the design commission this one in equal para uh, for the para uh, SEDC, they wanted to build their corporate tower and they envisioned a, a convention hall, exposition, uh, conference, I mean, complex, and hotel to, to complement their, their complex. So we envision uh, having the, the tower uh, on top of the hill uh, that oversees uh, the plus highway. This is if you are coming from south from Ipoh before going towards the Menorah Tunnel to the north. So on the left is uh, the, the tower. And also because of this disused mining pool, we decided to have a floating hotel uh, hovering over the, the mining pool. So unfortunately, due to budget cut, we only managed to proceed with uh, our uh, corporate uh, tower also. So we want the form to be dynamic, progressive. And of course, uh, if you notice this is just uh, our transformation of the our earlier uh, design competition for the National Theatre. 
So that's uh, after going a series of refinement, cost cutting exercise from our initial idea to this, and eventually what's been built eh, is something like this, eh? totally different eh, from our initial ideas, but still eh, have this pointed uh, yes for our towers, which to us is actually our Batman tower. <laughs> so that's our uh, vision to create a man tower. So Batman is actually not in Gotham City, but actually resided in Ipoh, Perak, Malaysia. Okay, so that's the my, our Batman Tower, uh, and this is the plus highway going to the north. And we have also one project here. Uh, it's a complex where you can renew your passport and your my card uh, under one roof. Uh, so it's for the Kementerian or uh, the Kementerian Dalam Negeri. Uh, we manage uh, about seven uh, government agencies. Uh. Okay, now we go to, to Barcelona, uh, looking at design with urban context. So this one, uh, Barcelona Museum of Contemporary Art, uh, designed by Richard Meyer. Uh, so you can feel uh, the, the building in white, somehow a part of this urban fabric uh, of the old uh, Barcelona. Uh, because of the nature of existing structure, very close uh, quarters, uh, very tight side. Somehow Richard Meyer did uh, manage uh, to, to integrate his museum with the existing uh, rich uh, urban fabric. So it's quite uh, contextually responsive in its scales and orientation. And this museum also plays a key role in restructuring the Gothic uh, district of Barcelona. So that is uh, uh, the, the, the museum, very tight side. So the frontage is only towards this uh, uh, small bit uh, plaza, whereas the, the others is very close uh, to the existing uh, structure. So again, uh, the figure ground studies. So Richard Meyer studied how uh, this new form uh, will uh, blend together with the, the rich uh, urban fabric of the old quarters of Barcelona. And he, he liked to use this ram, the circular or, or horizontal ram for, for the movement of visitors. And his so-called module also um, is somehow uh, re retracted from the existing uh, structure of building and he's always have this signature piano or organic shape uh, atria or atrium. So that's the, the white pearl, they call it, uh, the museum uh, contrasts uh, with the earthy colors of the, the urban uh, fabric of Barcelona. Uh, so the white, the purity of white, uh, somehow elevate uh, or enhance uh, the other uh, surroundings. So he is always like to uh, Richard Meyer always like to to have this natural light that that lit up uh, the internal space. Uh, but of course he he always uh, diffuse the light, so no direct sunlight enter into the building except for the circulation. Because in Mediterranean countries or climate, uh, you need that sunlight also uh, to warm up uh, the, the internal space during winter time. And there's another museum uh, in Frankfurt, a Museum of Decorative Arts. Uh. So this one, the, the, the task is to blend the new uh, museum with an existing uh, uh, villa, and also to take into account the, the neighborhood and the, the river, the, the main uh, Frankfurt River. So, the character of the surrounding environment had a decisive impact on the form of this building. So existing building somehow uh, dictate uh, the form of the new museum. And also uh, Richard Meyer took into account uh, and also pay homage, respect of the local uh, villa 
typology, uh, typology and also topology. You know? So it's designed as a part of a new cultural district on the banks of River Main, the so-called Museum Fur. This art museum was a traditional work in that it was part of the conversion of residential quarter that turned into a public institutional usage. So that's uh, the new museum in L shape and uh, the existing uh, villa. So he tried to, to juxtapose two axes, one relate to the villa and another relate to the to the river. So always look uh, when you are designing to opportunities to, to have this axis, uh, a very strong axis that, that relate uh, to existing building or natural surrounding or river, roads, uh, or even an implied connection to far away structure. So you have to make that connection. Uh. To, 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 to justify eh, your, your design, the way it looks. Eh? So <clears> the <throat> sketch eh, and how we envision eh, the work, eh, the L shape somehow pay uh, respect, pay homage to, to existing uh, villa, even the, the grid also eh, uh, is uh, extracted from uh, the villa, the modules, the way, the, the windows uh, treatments of the villa somehow translated, transformed into the museum. So that's uh, the ideal view of the connection between uh, the, the new museum and also uh, the villa notice of the dormer uh, windows here, the form somehow it's replicated uh, into the new design. It's very subtle, but that's what uh, makes it work. Eh? So you can have a sense of place that, that if you plug the design and put it somewhere else, it just won't work. Eh? So that's what we mean by, by having uh, that sense of place that, that it just suited the site and also the existing uh, building or, or surrounding. So again, the, the, the way uh, Richard Meyer treat uh, natural light coming in through the, the ramps, uh, the, the light just filtered through uh, the openings. Uh, and even the spaces also uh, somehow uh, relate to the existing spaces of the villa. So that's the, the old villa. And uh, also, there's a bridge connecting the new and the old. So there's a dialogue between uh, the old and the new structure, and that bridge uh, represent that that connectivity uh, from the past uh, to the new. So always look uh, for that opportunity when you develop uh, your design. And of course, there are so many museums uh, designed by by Richard Meyer. So this one in. Uh, Atlanta, USA, so please have a look. And I think you can go to richardmeyer.com and see his uh, houses, um, beautiful design also, and also uh, corporate uh, headquarters also. This is also uh, his idea of bringing uh, visitors uh, by extending this ramp to grip, to grab the Paris Red into this building. Uh. Okay, another thing about design with historical context, this is a beautiful creation by Ain Pei. Uh, Ain Pei is a Chinese American uh, that was commissioned, uh, or actually he won this design competition to add a new addition to the Louvre Museum in Paris. And, and somehow uh, this glass pyramid, the basic form, uh, somehow blends uh, well with the, the integrate uh, baroque structure of the existing Louvre Museum. And that, that glass transparency uh, actually, uh, in fact, uh, enhance uh, the intricate uh, details of the baroque architecture. So to uh, I'm pay that uh, architecture is a pragmatic art to become art, it must be built on a foundation of necessity. So that's also uh, I'm pay. 
uh, during the construction. So he died last year, 2019, I believe, after 100 years of eh, life. So this inverted pyramid also you know, bringing natural daylight to the underground uh, museum spaces. And this is where Mona Lisa, the famous painting, uh, put on display. But during my visit, I did not got a chance to, to view uh, Mona Lisa because it was a long, very long queue. And of course, uh, the price also is quite expensive for a budget traveler like me. Hopefully one day I will get a chance eh, to revisit. Eh? So that was me with my wife in 1996. Uh, no selfie, no handphone, just our tripod and uh, our camera to capture eh, our moment in, in Paris and eh, France. So this is also another uh, design competition in 1993 uh, when I was working at Architect MEA. So we entered for the National Arts Gallery uh, to, to replace the Balai Seni Lukis Negara in KL. So we, I think at that time, uh, Tun Mahade was the Prime Minister. So as he goes, uh, as he went along uh, to view the, the entries, when he, he looked at our design immediately, he said, I want this one, uh, even though he did not look at the floor pen or other drawing, just look at that image and say, that's it, I want this one. So we won the competition and uh, the private, the design contractor YTL. So they uh, built this one at their own cost and in return, the government uh, gave to them the, the former Balasan Elkis uh, building and they converted into six star hotel. So it's a win to win, a win win situation for both parties. But unfortunately, uh, being a design contractor, they butchered our design. So along the way, we have to, to resign as the, the architect because we are not agreed with what uh, uh, YTL has done to our design. The, the, flimsy structures um, and the form also uh, is not the same as what we have ambition. So along the way, we quit and they appoint an architect to continue the project. So that's how it looks uh, when it was completed. And looking at the, the site context, if you notice, uh, this is our National Art Gallery and this is the Istana Budaya or National Theatre. So I think we started first, and the why the reason we oriented uh, obliquely from the road because we want uh, as the motorist driving through to we'll have a glimpse of that. Uh. So by having it skewed uh, against the, the road, so somehow it give a very monumental effect to to the gallery uh, or the national art gallery. So our intention was replicated by uh, the, the National Theatre also uh, to capture uh, the, the new FK stuck uh, in the, the horrendous uh, Jalan Tunazak Jam. Okay? So again, uh, when your design is facing a, a public uh, road, so try uh, to have your, your building stand out by having it skewed uh, from, from the main road. So, to give this grand uh, monumental effect uh, to your design. <clears throat> so that's how the buildings look like uh, today. Uh, today it's called uh, Balai Seni Visual uh, Negara. Not only Balai Seni Lukis, but also Seni Visual, a uh, new term. Uh. And another building also in uh, Tamas Tewansa KL. So, Again, it's a design competition, so we have to consider this existing building, a former corporate office for Island and Peninsula, a prominent developer at one time. So this building has this Mediterranean flavor, a design by Amatian architect Barry Bekus that works together with Dato' architect Hajida. And somehow, uh, 
we are saying that uh, that uh, image should be reflected in in the design competition for a shop office so we totally uh, changed the perception of the normal shop office uh, where you have car parks uh, near the building but what we did is elevate the building and have the, the car park in the sub basement uh, parking level so that we free uh, the, the plaza away from cars if the normal shop house of course uh, once you have the road then the workshop car workshop will be uh, at the, the front so we don't want that so that's why we elevate and even the form also have this mediterranean flavor we, we try to emulate uh, the turrets and the tiered roofs uh, and the deep recess windows even the colors also have this mediterranean flavor so that's why uh, we want it i think uh, and also justify also the, the t-shirt but of course being a shop uh, office we have to maximize uh, the floor area that's why it's a look bulky compared to, to the the show house uh, which is actually it's meant uh, for a condominium so but again and uh, that uh, that reference or, or, or our intention uh, to reflect the, the new and the old uh, design so that's how the buildings look like uh. Well, after construction, of course, very beautiful. That, but again, once the tenants come in, eh, they have this aircon. Even though we provide eh, ledges for account uh, uh, for the aircon units at the back, but somehow eh, they want it much easier. So all the aircons are now hung eh, uh, up front, and the signage also eh, have defaced uh, our uh, building. Eh. So this one constructed 19, uh, completed 1998. So it's quite a tough time also at that time. So uh, Malaysia was suffering our second uh, economic downturn. The first one was in 1988. 1998 was the second one and that I've experienced, if I'm not mistaken, during this time, uh, the infamous black eye of uh, Anwar Ibrahim. So September 1st, we, we held the Commonwealth Games and everything was good. And suddenly, Mahathir sacked Anwar from the cabinet on hell, all hell break loose after that. And quite a, a tumultuous uh, moment uh, with the chant of reform uh, at that time. Uh. So quite scary, uh, but somehow we managed. Uh, and during this time also, the contractor was having a uh, difficulty. Uh, they almost went bankrupt. In fact, when, when we complete this building, they just went kaput, went bankrupt. Uh, so we had to drag the contractor literally to complete uh, the, the building. Uh, so quite a good experience also for me uh, to, to somehow complete uh, the building uh, on our own without uh, the contractor. So we had to, to do a lot of subcontracting uh, to other contractors uh, to get the job done. Uh. So again, uh, when we design also, we should consider the microclimate. So this one by Hassan Fati in Egypt. So Egypt being a, a arid and dry uh, countries or dry climate. So we like to use clay uh, or to and also a lot of uh, ventilation uh, to to have a passive cooling for his design and of course Charles Correa also uh, known for his tropical design it's, it's uh, a good mix uh, of uh, ex uh, exterior and interior spaces just blend uh, together so <coughs> in Malaysia of course uh, being uh, humid uh, uh, and also tropical climate, we have heavy rainfall. Our Malay house, uh, our vernacular architecture is a good uh, uh, design strategy uh, for a tropical country like Malaysia. So we have this uh, Malay house uh, elevated to allow for, for ventilation underneath and also to filter through uh, the floors and up to the attic or, or the roof. Uh, and also the cross ventilation and the material use, eh? it just uh, uh, by having this elevated 
or, or, or buildings on still also minimize eh, the damage done to, to the ground also. So again, uh, when you're looking into microclimate, always uh, have this reference of the Malay house eh, that you can emulate. Eh? So that's what happened in Thailand also. Eh? So uh, in 2014, after a strong earthquake, uh, they have to replace a lot of schools. Um, so they have to come up with a prefab, prefab uh, school uh, that use uh, the, not, the uh, local material also uh, that can be easily transported and constructed at site. Uh. So that's uh, the form. Uh. Again, uh, it's uh, <coughs> probably uh, uh, come from from the vernacular architecture of uh, Thailand also. And they use a lot of bamboos and, and timber also. Very homely uh, feeling uh, to, to the school with a lot of uh, natural daylighting. And of course, because of the, the okay, this in their design progress, uh, see how it's very articulated, uh, the way they develop their uh, design. So, of course, the pitch roof uh, for easy uh, rainwater to fall through and also give a very lofty uh, ceiling to the uh, stack of ventilation to, to pull down the, the spaces. Huh? So, again, uh, it's good uh, reflection of how uh, to use a natural material available at, at, at site. Huh? Okay, so uh, we also have uh, experience uh, working with our indigenous people, our orang asli in Tapa Perak. So uh, I did manage uh, to bring uh, our students as volunteer to work on uh, Terata Semai project, which is to build uh, houses for our orang asli. Uh. So I think about in total, we managed to build about 50 houses using timber, bamboo, and uh, metal decking also with the help of our student and also from uh, agencies like uh, Madlis Bandaraya Ipo and uh, from the Bumi, Bumi Putra Contractor Association. And uh, we did get uh, funding from Malaysian Medical Association and from individuals and also from uh, private uh, entities to to assist us in building uh, these uh, homes for our indigenous people. So uh, for the base, uh, we have this uh, PVC pipe, poured concrete into it, and then we have this timber joist uh, and timber plywood for the, the floor. And what we did was we just built the, the structure with the roof over, and then the, the orang asli will have to fill up the, the the wall with either bamboo panels or bertam walls. So they have to, to source it from the, the jungle. So of course the idea is eh, for them to, to have resources and near them to, to add on to their home. So we give uh, like a Roma Ibu, only one uh, big open space and it's up to the, the owners to how they want to further develop from the knowledge that they gain from our construction techniques and method, they later on, uh, on their own, uh, will source the materials and continue their houses either to add the, the kitchen or add more bedrooms or living rooms. So, so it, we leave it to them. So the idea is not to give a house, but we want them to work uh, to, to get their house completed with the assistance of student uh, and uh, uh, outsiders uh, uh, volunteers. So it's a good experience also for, for UPM students to learn uh, about uh, construction, to feel the materials and to see how, how, how it's being done and also the way the craftsman comes in and, and get the natural material like bamboo and bertam uh, to fill up the, the wall spaces. Uh. So that's uh, the craftsman, uh, Bahadek, uh, teaching our staff and our students how to, to weave uh, 
this uh, this uh, wall panel also. So even uh, one of the side uh, is quite remote that you can access through motorbikes or by walking quite far, I think about 10 kilometers uh, deep into the jungle. And somehow uh, one volunteers from Netherlands, uh, architecture student, uh, um, Mr. Bart uh, from Netherlands, he stayed with the Orang Asli in their kampung for I think, one week. Uh, just to experience uh, their, their culture and he really loved uh, Samba Blachan and of course Durian, uh, his favorite. Uh, so we call him Badrol uh, to have the local flavor. And the Durian and the wild Durian were just simply marvelous. Uh, and of course uh, the setting, the beautiful uh, scenery, uh, very pristine. So for our effort, uh, we managed to get uh, the award, the Volunteers Measure Awards uh, in 2016. So at the same time also we embark on a community project to build community hall for one of the uh, settlers for the Orang Asli but this one because of public building we have to be have a very strong structure so we managed to to have uh, Al Ambia, uh, the contractor to volunteer their staff, their equipment, their material to build the foundation and also the roof uh, structure. So Alambia is the contractor that uh, constructed our PEM center and I also uh, worked with them during one of my projects in Upo, the, the complex that where you can uh, renew your passport and your uh, my card. We are very, you know, uh, what you call, uh, glad eh, that, that Al Ambia eh, comes uh, with us to teach also eh, our students eh, on uh, concrete construction. Eh. And of course, uh, we, we try to have the local uh, craftsmen to weave the panels and we did mix eh, with colored uh, windows to give a very colorful uh, uh, feeling to the community hall. So very intricate uh, uh, weaving panels against the colorful uh, tinted windows. So this one was featured quite prominently uh, uh, in newspapers also. This one we haven't got any award because uh, we haven't actually officiated the opening uh, we completed 2017, but somehow the, the VIPs are, you know, uh, very busy, the, the Menteri Besar. And of course, because of the change of government and the COVID, somehow we keep postponing our uh, opening ceremony. But the, the hall has been used by, by, the, by the community for wedding and such. Okay, this is the video of the Trata Semai project, a volunteer's uh, project to build homes for the uh, Orang Asli. Bilanya rumah macam ni Bila kehidupan saya sedikitlah berubah Mana saya pun selesa Bertugas untuk menjaga rakyat Senang Mana bila tengah hari Ada rasa letih-letih Boleh ada Bukan rumah saya boleh berehat-rehat
okay, that's it for me. Thank you very much. So if there's any question, I'm glad to answer them. Okay, thank you so much, Architect Mio, for the very interesting and uh, rich sharing. We got enjoyed it and gained a lot of information. Um, okay, so we'll be having our Q&A session now. So we got one question from the audience. Uh, okay, from ha Hazim Zaim, can you please uh, advise on how do we design our, if our site happened to be on royal land nearby royal buildings, how do we design in response to the context without overshadowing the royal building? <clears throat> yeah, it's a very good question and also quite tough uh, to, to answer also. <clears throat> because dealing with the royalty, so you have to, to abide by their strict uh, protocol. Because your building cannot overshadow the, the palace or the royal building. So somehow you have to, uh, to uh, blend harmoniously with the, the, the building but at the same time you can assert uh, your your dominance uh, so you can also um, uh, uh, tweak your form uh, or the way you, you treat your materials to to, to somehow um, accept, uh, accept yourself but at the same time not uh, to empower to overpower uh, your more pro, uh, prominent or, or, or buildings eh? or existing building but of course um, uh, the, the royal uh, protocol is, is quite strict eh? I remember one building one project that I did a condominium uh, in Britfields uh, that this project I took over from another architect and somehow eh? I'm not quite uh, know the background, the history of the project, and when the building was up up to 12 floors, it's a 30-story condominium, and suddenly we got a call from DBKL calling us up and and mentioned that in our uh, DO condition, development order condition, that no windows should face uh, the royal palace. Uh, that's one of the condition. So somehow uh, the former architect mislooked this and I also took over without changing the, the facade and we have to change. So the, the structure already up. So when we come to install the windows, somehow we have to face the windows away from the, the royal palace or from the Istana. So that's what we have to do eh? to comply with our DO and also the, to comply from the uh, strict royal uh, protocol huh? so they don't want uh, anybody to, to snake or to take pictures huh? of the uh, royalties uh, inside the palace but of course once we completed our condominium they decided to move uh, the, the palace to Jalan Duta and now we are stuck with uh, windows that face away <laughs> from the palace that's what we have to do somehow adapt huh? Uh, based on uh, on 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 circumstances, so that's my my okay. answer. All right. Thanks. Thank you for the um, response. Um, okay. Yeah. I think that's that's all. Um, thank you for joining us for tonight. Hope you guys enjoyed it. So um, thank you again, uh, Architect Mio, for the for the sharing. So Thank keep, you for inviting me. <laughs> do keep in touch with us with our Masa's Instagram and Facebook for the next online lecture. So until then, uh, have a nice night uh, and we'll catch you next time. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you.